Hello and welcome to The Table. I'm Mark Winnell. I'm Steve Rain. And I'm Jonathan Hicks. In this episode we are looking at our top five small footprint games, I guess, with some reasoning behind it. I think I also include, not necessarily <laughs> yeah. a small footprint, but games that would be in a small packet. Okay. So sometimes you want something that doesn't take up a lot of space. Sometimes you want something that you could fit in like your luggage if you're going on holiday kind of thing. Yeah. It's physically small. So we were discussing some Facebook yeah. and Mark was asking when we were talking about it and we decided things you can fit in your pocket, your handbag, yeah. or mm -hmm. things you could play, for example, on a train or in a pub where you haven't got that much table space. Yeah, yeah. I've tried to try to cross those and do things that cover both situations. I, I changed it a bit because I was just getting a lot of card games, so I've actually got four of my five don't even need a table. Oh. So in yeah. terms of they're, they're small in the sense of that and you can play them outside, you, you, technically you can even play them outside. So I've gone a, a bit left field here. Okay, some of mine aren't that small, but certainly you could play them on, you know, like this sort of space. I, I think I've gone for a small footprint more than anything else. Yeah, I think I'm more along that sort of line. Okay. Marvellous. It's number five. Well, my number five is one I easily rate it quite highly, but I know Jonathan hates. It's cockroach poker. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, this has got a, a variance between our likes of it. Cockroach poker is super simple. You're basically just trying to palm cards off other people. So you're going to have a card and you go, you, well, your option is, do I go, it's the same thing, it's a different thing, or that's, and then you pass it on. Or your other option is to go to the person Yes, I believe you, or no, I don't. If you if you believe them, you're right. They get the card. If if you but if you get the wrong combination, so if you say they're wrong and they were telling you the truth, then you've got to keep it or whatever. So you're essentially trying to get rid of. I think there's only one loser, and once they hit five of the same type of card, they four, yeah, four, four the same, yeah. four the same, they are out, and the game ends, and there's only one loser. And it's it's super simple. Doesn't take up much space. Comes in a lovely square box and works fine. I think it's a hilarious game. I think. Jonathan doesn't like it because he doesn't like <laughs> certain party games uh, or, or lying games where you're thinking on the spot. So yeah, go, yeah. That's great. You go, this is a beat on. And Mark goes, no, it's a spider. Um, but you're aiming to pick on the people who've already got cards. So these people feel victimised <laughs> as such. Um, and you're trying to, and some people t go really quick and try and get away with getting really quick and trying to pass the book. And some people spend ages trying to work out if people are bluffing or not. I think it's a very good little card game. I like it. It's certainly an interesting one. Um, I think one of the reasons I'm not so keen is because you don't really have a lot of information to go on. As Steve says, you pass your card, it's a spider. Well, um, you know, if you look at it, you can't call them out. So all you've got is, they said it's a spider. Well, is it a spider? Is he telling the truth or isn't he? Um, so it, it feels quite random. And yet, in some situations, there's definitely a strategic advantage to saying one thing about another. If you've got two spiders already, you really don't want another spider. So if someone has two spiders and they pass you saying it's a spider, it's like, well, he, there's no way he wants it to be a spider. If I call him out and he gets it wrong and he'd kiss a spider. So you're trying to think it through, but then at the same time, you kind of lose track of, but he could just be lying, you know. It's, it's so that tension between trying to think too much and just trying to make a snap judgment. But you can do even better than that. Jonathan could have two spiders and I could, pa I could pass a spider to Mark saying it's a beetle. I said, Mark, this is a beetle. And if Mark looks at it and sees a spider, he's going to go, yeah, it's a beetle and pass it to Jonathan. And then you've got a spider to Jonathan indirectly. Yeah. If people have played it before, you get some very deep level bluffs. It's the fact that no one can win either. <laughs> You're playing and playing and playing just to find out who's going to lose the game. Yes, yeah, I, think, I think that's fine. Not many games do that. And, yeah. it's, and the round of drinks is on there. <laughs> yeah. Again, in the right crowd, I'm sure it goes down well, but I am not the right crowd <laughs> in this game. Uh, so, my number five is a game you play with the pen and paper. It had, there has been an official release uh, this year called Where Words, but uh, the game I'm talking about is Insider, mainly because I haven't played Where Words, although it does some things I think I'm going to like. Uh, Insider, you've got one person who um, uh, writes a word down on a piece of paper, so it could be bucket or it could be, um, it's got to be like a, a noun of some sort, hasn't it? It's got to be yeah. a person, place or thing, I, I think, in the version we've played. And so let's say it's bucket, and I write bucket down and there'll be a host of people around the table. But one of those person, people's Insider, it might be Mark. And so I tell everyone, close your eyes, inside or open your eyes, and Mark would open his eyes and see the words book in, and I put the piece of paper face down. And then you basically, you've got five minutes to play a version of 20 questions where you get more than 20 questions, and you take it in turns to say yes, no questions. And Mark would say, uh, is it an object? And I'd go, yes. And Jonathan goes, is it uh, alive? Big, 
is it is is it alive? He and I would go no. And then the next person goes, is it bigger than a house? And I would go no, and so on and so on and so on. You got five minutes, and for the team to win, someone's got to say, is it a bucket in five minutes? Okay. However, if they get that and don't out the insider, the insider wins. Yes. So you have to not only get the fact that it's a bucket, but once you've got the fact it's a bucket, you go, right, who, who's the insider? Because someone knew it was a bucket. So Mark, if, you, if the people are miles away, he's going to be leading them. Uh, is it made of metal, they'll say. He's going to be leading them in the right direction. Okay? Just so that they get the word in five minutes, otherwise no one can win. And so you've got that added element. So basically it's 20 questions, but with like a hidden identity game, mm -hmm. and I really like it. And you can play it just with a pen and paper. Right. Yeah, yeah, it's really flexible and it does work really well in lots of different uh, settings with different kinds of people, so that's great. But it is nice that whole tension between, like, as the insider, mm. you want them to get closer, but you don't want to make it obvious, so yeah. you need to lead them without leading them. It, and you've got to, you've got to, no, if, if they're getting close, you don't want to ask questions that are going to confuse the issue. You don't want to ask questions that are going to put them down the wrong path. Yeah. Um, but equally, you've got to come across as if you don't really know what you're doing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's nice. Yeah, I've played it a couple of times. It's definitely fun. I've enjoyed it. All right, to my number five. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm a big fan of Seven Wonders, played it a lot over the years, and there is a two-player version of Seven Wonders that comes in the box, but it's really not very good. So when the Seven Wonders Duel came out, I was like, ooh, maybe this is a good version, because it's a game, in terms of the style of the game, I've really wanted to play with, you know, in a two-player setting. Uh, but Seven Wonders Duel just does it so well. Uh, it's a nice, uh, small box, um, but gives you the whole Seven Wonders drafting experience. Um, and essentially, you know, you're picking cards, trying to get sets to get points. But the really interesting thing about this is a, like a, a tableau of cards in terms of how they're arranged in the middle. There's a card game called Pyramids where you can't get the cards above until you've uncovered the ones below. Yes, yeah. so they kind of overlap each other to a certain extent. So instead of drafting from a hand of cards, you're picking from the middle. So it's like, okay, my turn, I'm going to pick this one. But then that might reveal another card underneath that then your opponent could take. So it's like, this card would be really good for me, but if I take it, it's going to unlock this card, which is really good for them. So the whole tension between what you take and what you leave them with is, is great, works really well. Sometimes they're face up and sometimes they're face down. So sometimes you know exactly what you're leaving them and you think yeah. you're fine with it. Sometimes you think, there's been no military cards left if I take this and that flips over and it's a military card, I do bad. And the other thing that's really nice about it, I think, is the different win conditions. So there's the normal seven winners drums, just trying to go for points. If you get enough, say blue cards, yellow cards, you get different points for different sets. But if you get a certain number of military symbols, like more than your opponents, like a tug of war, if you manage to pull this um, military icon token thing far enough to one end, as soon as it hits your end, you just win instantly. It doesn't matter how many points anyone's got, you just win. And the other one is the science victory. If you get enough of the different science cards, again, you just instantly win. So I've seen it actually won all three ways. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. Probably just as much as commonly as any other, it, it can be quite tricky to stop somebody who's got quite a lot of military from getting more because of the whole thing of where the cards are. It's like, I really need to get this one. Oh, but he's going to get the military. I'm going to have to stop him from getting the military. And it's just great. It works really well, I think. I like the expansion because it adds the twist in that you can stop your turn essentially. You can take an action outside of that main board, okay. which allows you to stop that. Because the one thing I find with playing more and more, it can become a little predictable. Because you can sort of see the path. I mean, you don't. You know what cards are coming up entirely, but you can sort of see the path as it works through. I've conceded the game to you before at the third age when I realised that in five turns time you'd get your last sign symbol. And yeah. you can't stop, anything, I couldn't yeah. stop you, so I quite like that. I'm probably not giving this game justice because I think a lot of people seem to like it. I don't like it. Yeah, I was surprised actually. I remember I played it with Steve. I said, "Oh, Steve, you'll like this," and he didn't. <laughs> it, was my, it was my game we played. Oh, was it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I own it. Yeah. Right. Um, but yeah, I'm not. I, I, I wouldn't say no to playing it, but I, if I wanted to play a two-player game, I've got loads of others I'd love to play. Mm. Okay. Well, I never. It's number four. Uh, so my number four is a game you can play without a table again, but you do need the box, uh, and that is Mafia the Cuba. Oh, yes. Which is uh, a game where one of you is the Godfather, and the Godfather has some gems in his box at the start of the game and the Godfather can take some out at the start of the game and he then passes his, his box of cigars, he's very thematic, he says, here guys, have some cigars and the cigar box passes on the table and when it comes back to him, it's invariably very empty and in the box uh, there are diamonds and there are rolls. So when it gets to you, so it's Mark's turn, I'm the Godfather, I've never been the Godfather yet, but when he gets to <laughs> Mark's turn, he kind of flips open the lid of the box, 
count what's in there, it's very important to count what's in there at the start of your account, and then Mark can take any number of diamonds or a roll. So it can be an FBI agent or a henchman or something like that, or the cleaner or the driver. Um, so let's say Mark takes four diamonds and Jonathan gets there and he goes, there's not many diamonds left, maybe Mark took diamonds. I'll be the henchman and I'll try and out Mark and so on. He passes around and gets back to the Godfather. And then the Godfather can ask someone what they saw, he can ask some questions and so on. So you might say, Jonathan, what did you see in the box? And you'd say, well, I took the henchman, uh, but there weren't many diamonds when I'm there. I go, oh, Mark, what did you see? And Mark goes, I took the henchman, but I passed loads of diamonds on. <laughs> and so I'm, uh, I'm yeah. going to try and get it. What did you see? And you're trying to go around the people, trying to out the lie. And what the Godfather has to do is, is find all the diamonds back. Okay, and he makes guess. If I say, uh, Jonathan, did you steal any diamonds? And Jonathan reveals his role. And I have some rum. I was like, I'm sorry, I have some rum. When I run out of rum, when I guess, and I haven't got all the diamonds in, and I guess wrong, I lose. And the person with the most diamonds wins. Right. So it's not just about getting away with it, it's about getting away with, it with the most diamonds. If you just steal one diamond, the only way you're winning is if the Godfather finds all the other diamonds by yours. So you might have to try and take more than one. I think it's just a very nice game. It has fallen flat a few times, and not necessarily because the game's bad, but but if you get a couple of people in the game who kind of make it a bit slow and a bit unfun. Mm. I think it's tricky to know what to do the first time you play. Mm. Mm. You get the box, it's like, if I just grab a whole handful of diamonds, mm. but then it's going to be really obvious. Maybe I have to take the rolls. What do these rolls do again? You do need to have played it a few times mm. before you get it. But then it does work well. Yeah. I think sometimes you have too many people, but maybe... Total of six or seven is quite nice. So you can ask, you know, yeah. you're asking five or six people what they did. Yeah, yeah. Um, I really enjoyed it every time yeah, I played it. Yeah, I've enjoyed it too. It's just, but yeah, I've you just seen it. That's yeah, a... the box might not necessarily be the easiest to carry yeah. around, but all you need to play is the box. So you can yeah. play it outside. You can play it around the pub table with full of drinks. So you don't need the table itself. Um, so that's why I picked it. Okay. My uh, next pick, you definitely do need the table for. And a phone, ideally, it's One Night Ultimate Werewolf. Uh, this is the version where you're playing with an app and it just works so well. I mean, the box is teeny tiny um, and it's definitely one I've taken on holiday more than once. Um, and I've seen it just go down well in every situation I've ever tried it in. Essentially, it's just the game split into two phases, night and day. Night time, everyone has a role. Some people are werewolves, some people have other roles, like uh, you might have a witch, you can look at certain cards and things. Um, but everyone closes their eyes and one at a time people wake up and do whatever their role does and then at the end uh, you have the day phase, everyone wakes up and you basically accuse each other, tell each other what you think just happened, who's done what uh, and most of the roles involve either swapping people's roles or looking at other roles and you're trying to work out who the werewolves are and at the end of it all, three, two, one, vote and you point at who you think the werewolves are but the werewolves are obviously trying to stick together and avoid being picked out, they're trying to accuse one of the villagers so it's the classic social deduction game in many ways um, but still one of my favourites. It just works so well. It's really short. You know, you can play a game in five minutes. It's, I think it's fantastic. Yeah, mm -hmm. it benefits as well because you can swap roles. You can wake up and be something different and yeah. you don't know. Yeah. You don't know necessarily a role's been swapped. And I also think if it's a, if it's a game you're taking away to a non-gaming convention, a non-gaming thing, it plays so many people. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's very accessible to kind of, as long as you've got at least four, you can play it with kind of anyone and anyone, everyone. Yeah, the app makes a huge difference because you don't necessarily need to know and go in knowing everything. The app, the app will walk you through yeah, in most situations great. most of what you've got to do. And if you're playing with some of the more complex ones, but then you probably stops, want to in, put them straight in stops anyway. It stops yeah. you going wrong. Yeah. Wake up and do exactly what I'm about to say. <laughs> yeah, and that's, yeah, yeah. that's really important when people yeah, just come and sit down. Agreed. Because the game it's based off is just called Werewolf originally. And as a student, I played it loads, and I've run loads and loads of different games of Wells in lots of different uh, groups of people. But this one does it much better. It's much shorter, and as you say, having the app means mm. I don't need to be sitting out telling everyone else what to do. I just let the app tell everyone what to do, and I can play as well. So, really enjoy it. It's one of my top, top games of all time. Let's go back and look at your top 30. <laughs> all the way through. <laughs> uh, my one, I guess, is sort of a chess variant in a strange way. It's the Duke. Oh, nice yeah, little, yeah. Uh, I've played a few times, it's really funny, essentially it is a chess variant, You're gonna, but with pieces with, that have different specific moves, which is like chess, but a large, much bigger range of moves than chess. Yeah. What's really quite cool as well is once they take an action, they flip over, and now their move has changed, their, their things that they can do and where they attack has changed. And because of that, it's just small, it, is, it plays in similar to chess, but you're just sometimes adding tasks to ability forces, sometimes you're... Uh, 
getting things in position, you've just got to keep keep alive. It's um, I don't really need to explain because it isn't like just where you start with everything on the board. You gain pieces when you want to gain pieces and yeah. out of the bag at random as well is also yeah. important. So you don't know what you're gaining. So you either move a piece yeah. or you add another piece to the board. But if you all you're doing is adding pieces to the board, there's a limit because you can only put them next to your king piece mm -hmm. or no, your duke piece. Um, so they're going around taking your stuff, and all you're doing is adding to the board. However, you can move your piece. So your king piece, I think, moves one forward or one back. So if I'm moving one forward, he flips over. And now he can only move one left or one right. So if you're trying to avoid being taken, you think, brilliant, if I move two spaces that way, but I can't. Yeah. Um, and all the other pieces do the same. You think, brilliant, ah, the king's right there. I can move two forward and then two forward again, and I've got him. I move two forward, I flip. Oh, no, this moves differently. Mm. Uh, and it's quite nice like that. It's very clever. And there's, there's different, um, you can play with different pieces each time, can't mm. you? It's not just a fixed set of pieces. Mm. So it adds variability. You know, a lot of modern board games um, do variability to, uh, really well in terms of whether it's special powers or different setups for the game. And this takes chess and adds that variability, which is really nice. Extraordinary. It's number three. All right, my number three is my favorite, what I'd call conventional card game to a certain extent, um, which you can almost play with a normal pack of cards, but it just has four extra special cards that get added in, and that's Tichu. Uh, it's a ladder climbing sort of trick, trick taking game. So you deal all the cards out, so you've got a big pile of cards, and someone will play a certain combination, so they might play pairs or three of a kind, or even a full house, so a certain combination of cards, and the next person has to play the same kind of combination, but higher. If they pair, play a pair of threes, you might play a pair of jacks or something. And on the face of it, you're trying to win points. Whoever places the last after everyone can't play anymore, you've got as high as you can go, the last person to play wins all the cards in the middle, and you get points for winning certain cards. But you get a lot of points if you manage to go out first along with your partner. It's best played with four people, so two um, pairs of two. And if you and your partner both go out first, you get tons and tons of points, and no one else gets any points for, the, for that game. So although on the face of it, it looks like you should be trying to win points in the middle, actually just trying to get rid of your cards is more important in many ways. Mm. Um, and the four special cards just do extra things, so one of them is like wild, one of them lets you immediately pass the lead to your partner. So there's just nice variations with those cards. Um, but it's just a great card game, one of those that you can just sit on a lazy afternoon and play round after round after round. It's, it's just so easy to play, so much fun. Its biggest strength is the cooperative nature of it, mm -hmm. because you think, it's, you're not just being selfish, I can get out here, I've got such a good hand, no one can stop me, I know I can. But if I do that, it's 2v1 against my partner. Yeah. Maybe I say, okay, I'm not going to, I can get out later, I'm just going to let my partner win. If my partner's winning the trick, but if they beat my partner's trick, I'll come in. Otherwise, yeah, yeah I'm going to let my partner hold the lead, Yeah, yeah. Um, giving him chance. And so that cooperative nature to it makes this game for me. I'll, although I, I love bridge, so I, I kind of already... Partial to that sort of game. Yeah, I wouldn't choose to play if it wasn't two v two. I think it's just a much better game. Yeah, there are rules for like three player games or something, but I'd say just four always player. four player two v two. And then also you've got to play the grand teacher rule and yes. let's see what I can do. Yeah, yeah. One of the great things about it, which is I've never seen in any other card game, is it's a particular combination of cards uh, called a bomb. So, for example, if you have four of a kind, that's one way of getting a bomb. And a bomb can be played at any time. So even if it's not your turn, you know, Steve's just about to play his hand and I go, bomb, and he just jumps <laughs> right in. Um, and the bomb beats everything. So it's, it's really does it, does it beat a higher bomb? It doesn't beat a higher bomb, does it? No, so if you play a bomb, a higher bomb will beat the bomb you just played, yeah. like anything else. Um, but in terms of all the other possible combinations that could be played, a bomb can always be played and it just beats whatever's been played. A lot of points in the middle and they've just mm -hmm. played two aces or something, you go, ha ha ha. <laughs> but it's hard. Again, it has that whole, you're passing cards at the start, but after having mm -hmm. dealt the cards out, you give one card to your opponent. Yeah. Each of and, that, and that is another strength. So I played a very similar game in college, which is why I picked Teach Up really quickly. Yeah. Um, but the, that was individual, but the passing of the cards to kind of, it filter your hand and make it better. Yeah. Uh, this single four, I don't want that. And my partner, oh, I've got a queen, I don't really want that. I'll give that to my partner. Yeah. Um, and that's where it's from. Uh, this one for me is a game that I kind of have enjoyed the more I've played it. I didn't expect to like it as much as I did initially. And that is the game. Or, yeah. And to a lesser extent, the game Jewel. But that's different, but also kind of similar. Where, so you have two piles of cards. Some going up, oh, two sets of two, isn't it? Going yeah, up. In the, in the full play. Yeah. Oh. So you have two that 
start at zero and go up, and two that start at nine, it's 199 and go down. Yeah, they start at 100 and you go down. And you're going down. Uh, and you're trying to play cards. and you can, uh, But the thing is, you can't chat or talk in it at all. So you're appropriately trying to get rid of all the cards. And you've got your hand... Uh, how is it? You have a whole hand of cards? Yeah, with hand of six. Yeah. six. And you have yeah. to play two. You can play more than two, but you have to play two. And you've got to play them on the other powers. And you can chat, but what you can't disclose is exactly what you've got in your hand. So I'd be like, no, I've not really got much choice here. And Jonathan goes, don't play on that power, please. Uh, I'd like to play on that one. And he said, Mark, what about you? And Mark goes, yeah, one of those two is fine. Um, but you're not allowed to disclose information about the hand. And the nice bit about it is you can improve the car, improve the powers by going 10 backwards. Yeah, that's really ten, nice. 10 the other way. Yeah. Um, so if you never go 10 the other way, you're going to lose the game. And yeah. it's, com it's, uh, it's a cooperative thing, so you're trying to work together. And at some point you think, well, if, if I can play on that to I can go 10 back. And then, Jonathan, d please leave that for me. Okay, I would like to go there. People might know what you've got, but as long as you're not adamant, you say, I can, I can improve that pile. Um, you, you, you know, there's, there's license. And sometimes there's nothing you can do. You're going to end up stuffing it around. <laughs> because so if you've got a bunch of high cards, like 80s and 90s, it's fine at the start because you can start to play them on the 100 and you're not bringing it down by very much. But then after you've gone down past 80 on the high piles, it, you know, your cards that are like 80 or 90, the only place you can play them on the piles that are going up well, if they're only on 20 and you take it to 80, it's like, ah, <laughs> you've always killed us already. But sometimes there's nothing you can do. So yeah, it's a nice tense. It's very much have that play a game straight away. Lots of times I've played, you'll play two or three games trying yeah, to beat it. Yeah, yeah. And it's quite nice in cooperative games. Like it's very quick and the, the chance of you beating is very low. I think mm. maybe even, even as 10% maybe oh, times. Really? I mm. mean, how many times have you won it? Not very often. I think maybe twice ever, mm. maybe two or three times ever, maybe. Yeah. Um, I've got right like, through the pack, but then some people struggle to get the remaining cards out of their hand, which that's the difficulty. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a very good game. I like it. I also quite like the face to face one as well. Yeah, the two player one, um, which is not cooperative; it's competitive. Yeah, which is interesting because normally the two player um, version is cooperative, the cooperative yeah, yeah. one. Yeah, but they made it competitive, and it works well. Mm. I like it. Really. Um. All right, my number three is uh, a game of hidden information, I suppose. It is Spyfall. And again, you don't need a table for Spyfall. If, if you, um, you know, just hold on to the cards you've got. And in Spyfall, you've got eight minutes to find out who doesn't know where they are. So we all get dealt some cards out. And we say, oh, brilliant. Oh, I'm at the cinema. And Mark goes, oh, I'm at the cinema. And Jonathan goes, spy. And then I'm at the cinema. And everyone knows at the cinema. And what you're trying to do is... You, um, you, you're asking each other questions, okay? And so I'm asking, you know, how's, how's the light in here, Jonathan? Uh, it's, um, it's a nice warm light. Yeah. Because I don't know where we are. <laughs> um, so, yeah, he doesn't know exactly. He might think we're maybe we're near a fire or something. And if obviously, if he's asked first off. But if I ask Mark, Mark how the light is, and Mark goes, it's pretty dark, mm. it gives Jonathan some information. Ooh. Yeah. There's like a grid, isn't there? You can see yeah. the possible locations. So there's like 20 different locations, and you've got eight minutes to try and out the spy. At any point, you can say, stop, I'd like to vote on Jonathan being the spy or Mark being the spy or something, and you go yay or nay. Yeah. Um, and too many nays, fine, you're carrying going. But at the end of the eight minutes, you go a bit like the werewolf game. You go three to one, and you vote for the person. If you out the spy, they get one guess as to where they are. If you don't out the spy, they win. Um, and that's as simple as that. It's quite a nice game. Uh, I think it's great. I think you can ask some really weird questions, um, really weird answers. Very nice. It says, you know, we were at the space station once and I said, would you bring your kids here? And Jonathan goes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> it's really hard as a spy because if you hesitate and like, um, uh, well, um, that's right. It just gives it away immediately. So you sometimes, I think, just have to take a risk and be confident. Most of these places would take it. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh, space station. <laughs> um, but you've also got to be careful with the question you ask. If you ask a really weird question for the place you're in, yeah, um, so, so people, I can't, I'm trying to think of one here, but you, you can be clever. If you're on a pirate ship, you go, are you going to, you know, well, there, you, know well, there, you get the idea, but you try and give information with the question you're asking as well. And other people go, yeah, I like that question. I think Steve does know he's from your question. Um, which can be the only way you let this game down is that there's hesitations between questioning and answering. Um, 
uh, you can't make you can't just gonna blurt out the first question you come to because that might make it too obvious to spy or might not give the spy enough time to think. But if you're sitting there for 20, 20 30 seconds trying to think of a question, it probably slows the game down a bit. You need the right kind of player or experienced mm. players or something. I've seen this fall flat a mm. few times, and that's the only issue with it. it. When it works, it works well. Some people just don't like being the spy. Or even they if you're not the really, spy, yeah. I've seen people really struggle just to ask a question. It's like, okay, I know we're at the beach, let's say. I have to ask a question that makes it obvious that I know we're at the beach, but doesn't give away we're at the beach. And what do I ask? And mislead, and you've mm. got to try and ask a question that's going to out the spy if you manage to ask the spy. That's right. So people just sit there going, ah, and everyone's like, come on, come on. We're just, we're just waiting. <laughs> and then you end up going, do you come here often? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so What's the weather like? Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's spiteful. Ah, spiffing. It's number two. So my number two is Hanimi Koji. I think I can pronounce that correctly. Yeah. Which is a I pick, you choose game. Uh, there are seven different geishas. And you're either trying to control at least four of them, or a combination of a number. Uh, but that is done by, you have four tiles, and you must play all four tiles in a round. So you're gonna have a certain number of cards in your hand, uh, and say, for example, one of the tiles is, I will give you, show you three cards, and you get to pick one of them, and I get the other two. Or another one is, I play two sets of two cards, uh, and you get to pick one set of two, and I get to pick the other two. And then there's one where you can hide the scoring, so it will get scored at the end, and then one that won't get scored. And that's it. But because the, the fun thing is, is that every option always seems like a bad option. Yeah. Uh, and so there's just there's a lot of thought going into such a simple game of, well, really, do I want to win these five? Because the, the, the numbers are important. There are like three sets of two, two sets of three, a four and a five. And they have the same number of cards as they're in that. So if you use control a two, you're going to need two cards guaranteed. If you use control a three, again, you need two. But the five, you're going to win with three. But the five's worth more points. So you're going to need a lot more investment to get in to win that. And so, and you just might not see the cards because one of the cards is not even in every round. So it's just that. It's a really simple game to play. But the thought process of none of these is a good option for me, how can I get it to work in my favour? So yeah, I, like. I like that mechanic in games. It feels like, you know, you don't. I know you don't. Um, <laughs> I've talked about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, I like that mechanic in games where you have got so many choices and they're all bad. Um, you have choice, but what you're doing in this game is you're giving the best choice to your opponent and you can choose what choice they have. It's weird like that, but you can kind of mitigate it a bit because you can, if you think, well, I'm going to give them some fives, and then I'm going to make sure fives don't score. And it's quite nice. It's been a while since I played it, but I do remember liking it. It's very well done, Zony. It's clever, the system. But yeah, I just don't, as you say, like that feeling of none of these options are good. It reminds me of Lost Cities, which is not. I didn't want to mention it because I don't know if anyone's said it. But. But that idea of. You don't want to do this, but equally you don't want to do this. It's like you're stuck between the devil and deep blue sea, and you've got to pick the least worst option for you. But then you're, you know, the person you're playing against is in the same boat. So I, I get the skill of the game. It's like who can pick the least worst option the best each time and take account of what your opponent's going to do and all the rest of it. Um, but that feeling is just like... Uh, you, every like time. you like Twilight Struggle. I know, I don't know what about it. It feels like there's far more options for Twilight Struggle. But there's some, sometimes they're all bad. And you yes. know, if you've got all their cards, they'll have all your cards. But in <laughs> Hannah Koji, I can't dump anything on the space race. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, me. me. Uh, yeah. So mine or two is uh, my last game you can play without a table. And that's because you put your cards in a headband. And that's Coyote. <laughs> yeah. um, Coyote, uh, there's a bit of divisiveness on the theme of Coyote. But basically, you put a headband, you put a feather in your cap. And all the feathers have numbers on, you're looking around the ring to see what the total of all the feathers are. And you go, oh, well, there's a three there, and there's a ten there, and there's a six and a one. And I'm going to say twelve. And then the next person can either call your number, and maybe twelve's too high, effectively you're trying to get up to the total without going over it. Or they can say hi, so I go twelve, thirteen, fifteen, seventeen, nineteen, I'm going to call a bluff on nineteen. And the loser of this confrontation will take a tomahawk to the head. 
effectively, and three time knocks you out. Uh, you <laughs> they, play just, they stick up at that. <laughs> yeah. that um, and if you see a group playing this on another table, or if in a pub, or wherever you might want to play this, you think, what on earth are they <laughs> yeah, doing? They've got hilarious. feathers in the caps. Um, but what makes this for me is the the different cards you've got. So it's not just all numbers. Mm, some of yeah. them are negative cards. Some of them are blue cards that do weird things. So like one of the blue cards makes the the largest number a negative. So if Jonathan's got a 10, but mine says max negative, that's a negative 10. And I'm the only one who doesn't know that, that my, that, you know, that's in my cap. Yeah. Um, but if Mark's got ma max minus, I can go, oh, brilliant. Yeah, uh, 22 Mark. And Mark, oh, I'm having a really big number and he doesn't. And you can bluff people out like that and I really like it. There's definitely a feeling at times of, I'm being done here. <laughs> I don't, I don't do know I, how. Do I just add, add yeah, just like, I, I'm just going to add one and then straight away go, no, he was lying all along, you've been done no. in way before. Yeah. It's liar's dice without the dice, basically. Yeah, yeah, um, so. You I'm like liar's that. dice. Yeah. So. yeah. And I really enjoy this one as well. Because yeah. mm. you'd think you've almost got perfect information. You can see every single number bar the one on your own forehead. So you'd think you should be pretty confident about what the total's going to be. The rough total, yeah. But actually, because of the variation, as Steve says, with the things that might double one of the numbers or make it negative, sometimes you can be way off. So that whole bluffing element becomes really important. And I if, really enjoy if it. the first person's overestimated it as well, if the first person's gone, oh, 20, yeah. and the total's only 15, Mark goes, well, he said 20, but I can see quite... I must have a really big number, and Mark will go 21. And Jonathan goes, well, Mark hasn't called Steve's bluff, so maybe <laughs> I've got a really big number. And he goes around like that, and you could all be too bad for quite a while, and you have a big laugh. And even, one of the best things is when you're out. When you've had your three time locks and you're out, and you sit back from the back, and you can see what the total is for the rest of the people, and you're sitting there chuckling. Yeah, yeah, it's entertaining uh, to watch. That's very nice. My number two are we on? Mm -hmm. Is a game that Steve taught to me, and when he taught it to me, I was like, I'm not going to enjoy this game, Steve. Uh, because the theme is just sewing buttons onto a patchwork quilt. <laughs> and I was like, oh, really? But I played it, I was like, oh, that's actually all right. And I played it again, I was like, oh, I get the strategy here. And I played it again and again. And over the years, it's just gradually creeped up and up in my rankings, if you like, uh, to the point where I really enjoy this now. Uh, so patchwork, as it's called, it essentially is a two-player game. You're trying Tetris style to pick pieces from the middle and fit them into your grid. Um, but there's a nice little sort of slight engine building if you pick pieces that have got buttons on. Then when you go past certain points in the game, you get your income, all your buttons, and whoever has the most buttons at the end is the winner. But you're also spending the buttons to take the um, pieces out of the middle. The really nice tension in this one is each of the pieces has a cost in buttons, so you're spending victory points to get them. But equally, they have a cost in time, so you have a little time track, and when you run out of time, you can't do anything else. And when both people have run out of time, that's the end of the game. So you might have a piece that's really cheap in buttons, but uses lots of your time. So you want as much time as you can to get as many pieces, but you don't want to spend too many victor points to get it. It's like, ah, it's, it's really well done. I don't think I can improve on this game if I try. It's so well done, and if you take something worth a lot of time, your opponent could get two or even three turns in a row. Yeah, yeah. That's different. It's not just alternate turns, it's whoever's last on the time track. So or if they don't take a big bit of time, they get another go and then they get another go. So if you take too big a leap of time, it might be a really good piece. Obviously, yeah. if it's worth a lot of time to turn to your board, it probably is quite a good piece. But the risk in letting your opponent have like three choices before it gets back to you. And sometimes you can predict what choice your opponent's going to have before it's their turn. Yeah. You think, well, if I take that one, no, they'll get that. So I won't. I'll do this instead. Um, and then they're forced to give you the good option. When you look around at all the different pieces that are available, some of them are definitely better than others. But it's not always obvious which ones are the good pieces. And it sometimes depends on your situation. Because at the end of the game, you lose points for every empty square on your quilt. So you want to fill up as much of the space as you can. Um, so, it's kind of a risk reward, isn't it? You've yeah. got to value every piece, and every piece's value will change, as, let alone as you move around the time clock, but as the state of what you've got it, options available. And it's a continuous moving system because of that. Yeah. So it, you're literally just have to go, how good is that piece to me right now, or the next piece, or the next piece, and how good is it to play, and the other player as well? Because at the start of the game, all the pieces with the buttons on are very valuable because you keep getting that income throughout the game. Near the end of the game, the button pieces are no good to you at all. You just you want to fill up the space. Yeah. It is the, the the first game I'll suggest to any couple or two people come. Don't have to be you know don't have to be an actual couple. Just two people coming to the cafe and play. 
that I was going to two playground suggestions and like patchwork. But I have to preface this by saying it's about sewing things onto the quilt, but don't let that put you off. Because yeah. if that's what you get told about a game and you're not really into games that much, you go, really? A bit like Jonathan was in his first reaction. I just have to insist how good it is when people are giving it a go. It's that good. By Jove, it's number one. Okay, so now it's time for our number ones. But again, we still don't have the Between Two Seas cards. So Steve was very kind to come up with the question of what was the last board game we played? Yokohama. Terra Mystica. Codename is Duet. Uh, so this way end? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, there's going to be no surprise at what my number one small game is because it's my number one game of all time, and that's Hanabi, which is. It, I said TG was my favourite conventional card game because Hanabi feels very different, really. It's cooperative for a start. But the other big twist is you can't see your cards. Yeah, you have a hand of cards and you hold it so everyone else can see your cards. Um, and essentially you're just trying to give clues to people to get certain cards played into the middle. You're trying to get one, two, three, four, five of each of the different suits into the middle. Which sounds really simple, but it's a lot harder than it first appears. And there's a lot more sort of subtlety in terms of how you give the clues than first appears. So it's one of those games that really rewards practice. If you can play particularly with the same group of people, you can, can develop an understanding. So Usually if someone gives you a clue, you want to try and play the card. They're telling you this is a three, let's say, because it can be played. But at first when you play it, it's like, well, I know it's a three, but I don't know which pile to put it on. I need, you need to tell me the suit as well. And so after a while, you develop this um, shorthand, if you like, conventions of getting the cards played much quicker. Uh, it's just so unusual. Um, I think it probably has quite a bit in common with Bridge to a certain extent. It's like Bridge's baby brother to a certain extent. Uh, less so, but before I go any further, my number one is also Hanabi. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll join, I'll join in with you go here. Go for it. Uh, I think it's fantastic. I think when I thought about this list, I thought, well, I tried to pick some games without boxes. And I thought, travelling as well. I said, put in your pocket your handbag. What's the one game I always take away with me? In fact, that's the reason it's on the cafe at the moment. I forgot to bring it back in. And Hanabi, when I go and play bridge or go back to the family or go, go to see my brother or something like that, I'll take Hanabi thinking, yeah, we'll get a quick game of Hanabi or eight games of Hanabi or something. Yeah. Uh, I think it's very good. I think it's just... It's just great. I love it. And yet you both play it in very different ways. Uh, I'm coming around to what Jonathan's playing, yeah. but if I was to ever take <laughs> it to a non-game as I'd want to play two-player only. I still prefer the two-player version of it. We've been, I've been trying this two-player version with Steve. And it is really different, I suppose that's the thing. From the four or five player version, you've got quite a lot of um, cards visible, there's a lot of options in terms of what clues you can give. With a two player game, there's only one person you can give clues to, they've only got one hand of cards, it's like, ah, what do I pick? And, you know, you're very restricted. So you really have to think about the game quite differently. But it's been, I really enjoyed developing a different set of yeah. conventions, if you like, for what makes sense. What you'd use in a longer player game doesn't work because the benefits of, uh, it's, I think it's called a finesse or something, yeah. giving that player some information that tells this player to do something else is, uh, is something you can't do in a two-player game. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's Jonathan's favourite game of all time. It's one of my top, top games of all time. I think it's very, very good. Well, one and one isn't an RB. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's Welcome to the Dungeon. Oh yeah, it's yeah, yeah. a nice little game of dungeon crawling with cards, it sorts off, not really, because you're just basically egging people to go on. I can see why like this game, <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's, a, it's a funny sort of game where, so you're going to draw, draw a monster, and you can either put it into the deck, or you can go, no chance, and you can keep it yourself, but then you've got to get rid of one equipment, which will help you fight the monster in your deck. And while you're doing that, occasionally some will go, Pass, and they're out. They can't win because they can't go through the deck. But then eventually, everybody's going to chain go past, and you're going to be left sat there, and you're going to have to go into that, and you were completely unprepared for it. Yeah, you've got like you've got like seven items of equipment, yeah. um, but the only person to go in the dungeon is the last left standing because there's just one hero. Just to make this clear, yeah. everyone is effectively bidding to take this one hero through the dungeon and fight this one set of monsters. Yeah, but initially there's no monsters in. So well, well clearly I'm not. Go I'm going to pass. There's no monsters in. I've got all my brilliant equipment. I'm not going to pass. That's a dragon. Well, with all that equipment, I can f I can fight that dragon. I'll, I'm going to put that dragon in the dungeon. And then Mark goes, "Oh, it's a zombie. Yeah, a zombie's easy. I can fight that yeah. zombie." And then Jonathan goes, "Oh, they're getting a few monsters in there. Yeah, yeah, that's okay." And then my next thing, "Oh, it's another dragon. Oh, I can't fight two dragons, so I'm going to throw the dragon away um, and take his sh shield away." And the, the, the more monsters get added, the weaker the hero gets. And he's like, 
yeah, he's probably going to fail now, so I'm going to back out and pass. And the last person left in is the one to take them through. Uh, it's first person to succeed twice. Twice, yeah. yeah. And, but you also go out if you lose twice. Yeah. So, which is probably the biggest negative that somebody can go out really early. But I don't mind too. Well, yeah, you do have to lose twice yeah. in a row. I don't mind too much because it is fairly short, yeah. and I like the fact that you can effectively put something in which you know is going to make it really, really difficult. Um, but you have to hope that nobody's not passed by the time it gets back to you. That's right. So there's the whole bluffing thing of, oh yeah, yeah that's fine. I can definitely do that. And inside it's like, whoa! <laughs> you don't want to go through there. Because if you take that monster out, but take out the equipment that someone else knows is going to fight the monster they put in, you're like, oh, oh, I'm not going in. Yeah. yeah. So if you like, if you take if you take this this demon out and take away the sword, but the sword kills the dragon, and then the person who's put the dragon goes, no. Nope. And then Mark goes, chance. well, he passed quickly. <laughs> nope. <laughs> and then the person who's who's not only taken the sword out that fights the dragon, it has to be the one to fight it. Yeah. And each round you get a different hero, don't you? Yes. Yeah. There's so you a get like a mage and you yeah. keep swapping them out. That's yeah. right. Yeah. So you fight monsters in different ways, which is quite nice. Yeah, it's nice. Uh, I've played it quite a bit with the um, kids and uh, like nephews and nieces and things, and they all really enjoy it. Yeah. it works it's a weird well. push your look game, but it is mm -hmm. basically a push your look game at heart, isn't it? Yes, with the bluffing element. That's yeah. what I really like about it. But you don't have to lie. You, don't, you can just go in. Yeah. You don't have to put on that act about, you know, yes. oh yeah, ooh. But even, I find even the kids like doing that. <laughs> so, I mean, it's pretty obvious when they do it. So they'll pick something up and go, oh no, I don't want to fight that. And you know, it's just a little zombie or something. And it's like, oh, that'll be fine. Yeah. So, any other honourable mentions? Uh, I had quite a few, because obviously I, I restricted my list down to... Um, Things that you could take away from a place and play without a table. There are a lot of small games, I think, though, if you don't have that restriction. But yeah, well, I potentially could go on. I was, I was just looking down at the cafe's games, the little small box games on the shelf. I'm like, oh, yeah, Teach You's good, and Six Nymph, oh, that's a good card game, and No Thanks, that's a good card game. I was just getting card game after card game after card game. I didn't want a list of five card games, yeah. so I restricted it differently. But yeah, there's so many little good, even just two player card games or so on. So on. Even a pack of cards. I mean, a pack of cards is yeah. a great thing to just do because there are so many things you can do with a pack of cards. No, I just said code names. Uh, it was on the top of my list, actually. It was the first one I wrote down. Um, code names was the first one I wrote down. And another one I thought would be done, done or two other ones I thought would be done, would be Hive and uh, Love Letter. Oh, Hive, yeah. I did think about Love Letter. Um, um, because it's just not just a small footprint game, it's 16 cards. Yeah. It's such a. It's, it's probably one of the games with the fewest components in that I know. Um, but yeah, so Hive was a game that um, I lost my copy, I'm afraid, and so I haven't played it in quite a few years, but that's a good travel game as well, and yeah. you can just yeah, okay. play that on any surface, I guess. I've, on holiday, I've often taken away those, the box is kind of this sort of size, so the Lost Cities size, um, or the Patchwork size box, there's quite a few of those um, boxes that are that size, and it's a really nice size for taking on holiday, often two-player games. Um, the two-player version of um, Agricola as well, the All Creatures Big and Small. I really like that one. That was another short list for me. Well, I've got um, one of the magic deck boxes. Any oh, card okay. game can be struck like Hanabi's in a deck box because yeah. I t take it around so much. I don't want to get it beaten around. If you take it in a box, you have to either put an elastic band around and the box gets battered. Um, so just like a deck box for like a, some sort of collectible card game is great for taking things like Teach You and No Thanks and Hanabi yeah, yeah, mm. true. Uh, around. Obviously, I've gone down a different path with... And it's a small footprint, I think, oh yeah, that means I can take it places, but yeah. Um, yeah, well, that's been good. Anyway, so that's been our top five small footprint grains, and we've been the tape. I've been my winner. Steve Brown, Jonathan Hicks. Good night. See you later. Later.